Does your life have joy? Is your heart truly filled with joy? I am the true vine. You are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you are looking for happiness, for true joy that does not depend on circumstances, you need to look to Jesus because he wants to give you his joy. And not only does he want to give you joy, but God, the creator of the universe, Jesus, who resurrected from the dead, wants your joy to be complete. Abide in him and he will abide in you. And from our true vine, you will bear fruit in abundance. So there was once a farmer, and he began to look at his farm through a critical set of eyes. Everywhere he looked, he just found something wrong. So this farmer decided he was going to sell his farm. So he called up a realtor, and the realtor came out, took a look around, and, and then uh, the realtor went back to his office and, and uh, pen penciled out an ad that was going to be run in the newspaper to advertise that this farm was for sale. So before the ad ran, the realtor wanted to check with the owner, so he calls up the owner, and he uh, described the farm like this. It had a good location, a well-maintained house, sturdy barn, lush pasture, a beautiful pond, fertile soil, and a great view. The farmer listened to that, and he said, would you repeat that again? And he listed all those qualities, and then the farmer said, you know, I've always wanted a place like that. I think I'm going to stay right where I am, don't want to sell the place anymore. Attitude makes a huge difference in our lives in almost every area. Now, some of us know the name Karen Garrett. Karen and her husband Dave have been part of this fellowship for decades and decades, and, and she's going through a, a, a real difficult time now with cancer and has for a number of years. But, you know, we were just with Karen the other day, Pam and I, and she has a smile, she's confident, she's full of peace. Attitude makes a huge difference in how we go through life and especially through difficulties. This was also true with the Apostle Paul. This is our second message in our series through the book of Philippians. We're calling this series Choose Joy because Paul chooses joy and what he shows us with his example I think will help us to learn to choose joy in the experiences that we face. So we're in chapter 1 and verse 12. Paul is commenting on his uh, imprisonment at this point. Outwardly, his experiences were really, really difficult. But as we're going to see as we look at this passage, he has this amazing ability to, to look beyond his circumstances and to really experience the joy of the Lord. You can follow along in the text in your message notes if you care to. Chapter 1, verse 12. Now, I want you to know, Paul writes, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So when they translated palace guard, this is literally the Praetorian guard. These were 10,000 hand-picked Roman soldiers who were commissioned by Caesar Augustus. They were positioned around Rome to protect the emperor and to guard, guard the city. So Paul referring to that Praetorian guard it lets us know he's writing from Rome when this is taking place. He was guarded by these, by these guards. Now, the chains that Paul refers to in verse 14, these chains were about 18 inches long. And as long as the prisoner was in custody, he was chained to one of these Roman guards. 
24-7, every day, every week, every month. 18 inches away is a guard that he's chained to. Now that made certain that he, would have, that he wouldn't be able to escape, first of all, and also he would have no privacy. So put yourself in that position. A long time, in fact, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 and verse 30, we discover that Paul was in uh, house arrest with this guard for two years. Two years, you're connected to a guard, no privacy, no possibility of escape. And what's remarkable about this to me is the way that Paul is able to take lemons and make them lemonade. I mean, instead of being an inconvenience, he thinks this is a great opportunity because he has a captive audience. He has somebody 18 inches away that he can share Jesus with. And he does it for two years, guard after guard after guard. And these guards hear about Jesus. They go back to the barracks. They tell the rest of the the soldiers there, and so through that process, the whole barracks, the whole group of them began to hear about Jesus, and in the end, that was amazing. And not only that, but because of his chains, he was able to inspire the other believers that were in that area because they saw what he was doing. Paul demonstrates what I will call here today Romans 8.28 thinking, okay? This thinking allowed Paul... To, to, to trust God in spite of his circumstances being far less than ideal. Romans 8, 28 thinking expands our joy. You might want to jot that down in your note. Romans 8, 28 thinking expands our joy. Now, uh, I hope uh, most of us are aware of that verse. If not, I think it would be good if we could share it together. Let's share Romans 8, 28 off the screen here together. Would you say this with me? And we know... That in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. That's Romans 8.28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. This means that if we love God and if we're called according to his purpose, all things are going to work somehow to our good. So being in chains for two years for the Apostle Paul wasn't, you know, a, a terrible loss of time and inconvenience. Instead, God used it for his plan and his purposes. So the chains allowed Paul, as I just said, to share with his guards, and then they could share with their friends, and the other believers were encouraged. That's amazing. God also used this time in, in chains for Paul to have time to write letters. I mean, he was a busy guy. Well, God locked him up, well, the Romans locked him up. God used that time to allow him to write at least four letters, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Romans 8.28 thinking allows us to see beyond the circumstances that we're currently in. You know, usually, we only see what's right in front of us. Our perspective is really narrow because we only perceive What's going on, you know, right in front of us? But the Bible tells us that there's more that's going on than meets the eye. Now, I love the story in 2 Kings chapter 6. It's an amazing story. The Assyrians have come to capture Elisha. And they surround the city where Elisha is. And I love the way the story turns here because in the morning, Elisha's servant comes out. And he looks out and he sees the Assyrian soldiers all around and he starts wigging out and he goes, oh, master, there's so many of them. And, and God says to, or Elisha says, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those that were with them. And he prayed, Lord, open his eyes so he can see. The, the, the uh, servant's eyes were open and he saw behind the Assyrian soldiers all kinds of angelic and chariots of fire. They were there. He just didn't see them. There was more going on than he saw with his naked eye. Romans 8, 28 thinking helps us to see beyond with our naked eye. We begin to see from God's perspective. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, 
We're called according to his purpose. In other words, there's more that's going on than we can see with our naked eye. God is mysteriously at work weaving all of the circumstances that we face, especially the negative circumstances, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. He weaves it all together for his perfect plan. So Romans 8.28 thinking allows us to remain joyful even when things aren't particularly going well. We can have hope and confidence because God is somehow still at work. Kenneth Dodge tells a story about an eight-year-old boy named Frank. So Frank was looking forward to a Saturday going fishing with his dad. I mean, Friday night, he got all his fishing gear out, and he was so excited that the next day he was going to be able to go fishing, spend the whole day fishing. Woke up, and it was pouring rain, pouring rain so that... Uh, they weren't going to be able to go fishing. And this little Frank, this little eight-year-old Frank, just blew a cork. And he got mad, and he kicked the furniture. He kicked the dog, kicked the cat, and said, Why can't we go fishing? It's raining. Why could it rain today? And the dad tried to explain that the farmers needed the rain. But it didn't matter. Frank was just beside himself. And then about noon, it cleared up. And... Dad said, you know what, we couldn't go fishing all day, but we sure can go fishing this afternoon. And so they packed the stuff up in the truck, went off to the lake and fished, and that afternoon they caught more fish than they had ever caught before. It was just a glorious afternoon of fishing. And then that night they got back to the house, they prepared some of the fish, and they were cooking, they cooked the fish up, and they put it out at the dinner table, and Frank's dad had Frank pray. Now, this is the late year old prayer. This is the prayer. God, if I sounded a little grumpy earlier today, it was because I couldn't see far enough ahead. I couldn't see far enough ahead. That's the problem, isn't it? We don't see far enough ahead. We just see what's right here. We don't see that God is at work in bigger and broader ways. Romans 8, 28 thinking allows us to gain God's perspective, for we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. So one step you can take that will help you to choose joy would be to adopt this Romans 8.28 thinking. Look from God's perspective and see the grand picture. And even if it's still dark and you don't see clarity, trust that he is still at work. Romans 8.28 thinking. That's the first point. Now we go to verses 15 to 18. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. Paul talking about people that are preaching. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. So there's some good preachers out there. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. Now, have you ever noticed how easy it is for Christians to be judgmental and critical of other Christians? Have you ever noticed that? My, oh my. For as long as I've been a Christ follower, I have been astounded at, at how Christians lob grenades at other Christians. Now, a lot of this criticism, I think, has a root of pride. Somebody thinks that they have a corner on the spiritual market and their way of doing things is, is not just their way of doing things, it's the right way of doing things. And so, and so in matters of opinion, it's not, no, it's not so much a matter of opinion now, it's, it's what's right and wrong. My way's right and your way is wrong. I've seen this for all the years I've been a Christ follower. When I first became a Jesus follower in the 1970s, there was a new form of Christian worship that was being developed by Maranatha Music, and it was, it was contemporary, and it was different, and there was a whole tribe of Christians that were throwing grenades at, at this new form of worship. And then along the way came Bill Hybels and the Willow Creek Seeker Movement, and there was scathing criticism toward him and all the churches that were trying to reach lost people using another form of, of ministry that it was... Anyway, and then along came then Rick Warren and the Purpose Driven Church and the Purpose Driven Life. You know, the Purpose Driven Life 
sold more copies, millions of copies of books than any other book that I, I think, except for the Bible, that's ever been written. I mean, millions. But there were Christians that, that were heaping criticism on Rick Warren because, you know, he never mentioned hell in that purpose-driven life. That was the one thing. You know, they just... Put, so Christians have been blowing up Christians for as long as I've been a believer. And it's the easiest thing in the world to do. But it's the farthest thing from God's heart. It's the farthest thing from God's heart. Look at what Paul says. He says, sure, some people are preaching Christ for goofy reasons. In fact, some of them are actually trying to hurt me. But verse 18, he says, what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Paul takes the high road here, friends. He rejoices. He doesn't criticize. Now, I want you to think about this passage. It's really, really important. I, I want you to challenge me if I am misinterpreting it or misapplying it in any possible way. I don't think I am. So the next time you hear somebody on the radio or on TV or in person bash another Bible-believing church or Bible-believing Christian or leader for doing things differently. Remember this passage. Remember this passage. Paul's example teaches us to be gracious, especially when people think a little differently than we do. So what if they do things differently than we do? That's not my business. That's between them and God. I'm not responsible to be the critic of everyone around. I'm supposed to look at Jesus and follow his example. What does it matter, Paul says? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. So here's the point. You might want to jot this down. A gracious attitude expands joy. A gracious attitude expands joy. More fully, we could say it, a critical attitude will shrink joy. A gracious attitude will expand joy. Pat Riley is widely regarded as one of the most uh, effective leaders in the NBA, National Basketball Association. Uh, he used to coach the Los Angeles Lakers uh, when Magic Johnson played. Uh, Riley says that when Magic was in junior high, he was already such an exceptional player that uh, he would score 50 points in a junior high game and, and everyone else on his team would only score five points and they would win every game. He was that good as a junior hire. But some of the other players began to complain that they never, get a, they never got a chance to shoot because he was so good and, and, and they were winning every game, but they weren't having a chance to shoot. So Magic decided to change his role on the team. This was back in junior high. He decided he would begin to make the other people uh, succeed, make them, make them look good. He played only two years in college before he went professional with the Lakers. And when he got to the Lakers, they had a bunch of all-stars on the team. But they were all playing for themselves, and so they weren't really winning very often. And Magic came in and, and changed everything. Pat Riley says that Magic Johnson became the catalyst to make other players look good. He went to Byron Scott and said, I'm going to make you the number one scorer on this team. I'm going to pass the ball to you, and you're going to score. And Byron Scott did. Then he went to James Worthy and asked, why have you never made the all-star team? I'm going to make you an all-star. And he did. Magic started passing to Worthy, and the next thing you know, he was on the all-star team. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar scored the most points in the history of the NBA, the National Basketball Association. An astronomical achievement, an, an amazing record. Before he broke the record, Magic Johnson said to him, I want to be the guy that passes the ball to you when you make that record-breaking basket. <laughs> Pat Riley says this, on that night, when it was time for Jabbar to score the record-breaking basket, Magic got off the bench, put himself into the game, dribbled down the floor, 
passed the ball to Jabbar. The, went, the ball went through the hoop and the record was shattered. The all-time scoring record was broken. Righty says this. If you look at the video of that event, you'll see Magic Johnson leaping into the arms of Jabbar. And if you look closely, you'll see tears streaming down his cheeks. Right? He said, Magic was the most unselfish basketball player I've ever seen. And I say, and I say if that could work in basketball, can it not work in the church as well? When the gospel is preached by anyone, even with poor motives, Paul rejoiced. So I think the overarching principle might be stated like this. Uh, a critical attitude, that's going to shrink our joy. But a gracious attitude, it'll expand our joy. Paul wasn't soured by those who preached Christ out of selfish ambition. He had a gracious spirit because he, he focused on the bright side. At least Christ was being preached. Now at some point... Being joyful in this uh, direction comes to having a, you know, not being critical, being gracious, being positive. And so I think this would be a really good time to rehearse the, the verse that we're focusing on throughout this series. This is from Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. I think this, uh, this text underscores the importance of having a gracious attitude. Would you say it with me off the screen together? Let's read this and let it sink into our soul. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Philippians 4.8. I don't see whatever is critical, whatever is wrong, whatever needs to be corrected, I don't see that in, in that text anywhere. These are the things that we're to uh, be thinking about. Finally, in verses 18 to 26, I see one more mindset that will help us to expand joy. Remember, the whole series here, we're, we're, we're focusing on how we can overcome our circumstances with an attitude of joy. So it goes on, the text says, what, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this I rejoice. Yes, I, continue, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you, again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Now, the overriding theme in this uh, passage of Scripture, I believe, is a settled God confidence. A settled God confidence. God confidence will expand our joy when we are resiliently confident in God's presence, in His goodness, and His faithfulness. That will expand our joy. Paul says here, whether he lives or dies, it's win-win. To die will be to be with Jesus. To live will be to live for Jesus. And this amazing confidence allows Paul to experience joy while he's chained 18 inches from a Roman soldier. Now, if you look through that text, four qualities, four reasons are given for Paul's uh, God confidence. In verse 19, prayer is mentioned. Paul is confident that the Philippians are praying for him. Paul knows God responds to prayer, so his confidence is, is rooted in prayer. In verse 19, Paul also expresses confidence in the Holy Spirit's ability to help him. So the Holy Spirit is capable of, of helping him in his imprisonment. It will turn out positive because 
the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Verse 20, God expresses confidence in God's empowerment. The same God who sustained Paul when he was flogged uh, five times by the Jews, the same God that rescued him three times when he was shipwrecked, is still operative in his life. The term eagerly expect in verse 20, it's a, it's a curious term in the original language. Uh, the idea is sort of an outstretched neck. Think of a, a, of a little chick stretching its neck up to mother hen to receive the little you know, worms or whatever that are coming in. That's the idea. Paul has eager expectation that God is going to be with him. Finally, in verses 21 to 26, Paul writes about his confidence in God's plan, his settled conviction that whether he would live or die, God is in control and he has confidence that he is always going to be safe. Verse 25, convinced of this, I know that I will remain. I would prefer, he says, to go to be with you, Jesus, but I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. God confidence has an amazing way of expanding our joy. Our problems tend to grab our attention, focus our, our emotions, and, and we get sunk downward. God confidence lifts our eyes upward. Even though he's chained to a Roman soldier, he still has resolute confidence that God is in control. Paul is absolutely confident that God's purposes for his life are good and they will not be thwarted. And that level of confidence will help you to navigate, uh, navigate the struggles that you face and there's not, not one of us sitting in this room today that don't have a boatload of issues that, are, that could overwhelm us if we, if we focused on them excluding God. You might not be familiar with the name Adoniram Judson, but in the history of the world mission movement, the name Adoniram Judson is, is, is a superstar. He's on the Mount Rushmore of, of missionaries. He was the first foreign missionary sent from the United States into the foreign mission field back before anybody really had missions. He went to Burma and he faced extremely difficult challenges while he was there. He went in the early 1800s. Uh, in the first 14 years of his ministry, he had a handful of converts, that's just a handful, and he had a Burmese grammar. And in those 14 years, he had been put in prison for a year and a half. His wife and kids had died. So he went to Burma with his wife, his wife dies, his kids that were born had died, he had a handful of converts and a Burmese grammar. At that point he prayed that God would give him the strength to translate the entire Burmese Bible, uh, the, 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 the Bible into Burmese, and that he would have a church of a hundred people before he died. Over the ensuing 20 years, that's exactly what God gave him. The Burmese Bible translated and a church of about a hundred people. He said this at the end of his life, difficult life. He said, if I had not felt certain that every trial was ordered by infinite love and mercy, I could not have survived my accumulated suffering. If I had not felt certain that every trial was ordered by infinite love and mercy, that's God, grace, I could not have survived my accumulated sufferings. In other words, if he had not been supremely confident in, in God, he would have given up. This God confidence, I think, is captured in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Let's say that out loud, would you please, off the screen? For to me... To live is Christ, and to die is gain. That basically declares that our primary focus in life is settled. We're focused on Jesus. He's the center of the wheel. All the spokes of our life come out of that center point. Reminds me of a statement I read uh, several years ago of a Zimbabwe pastor, a young Zimbabwean pastor who was martyred for his faith. <laughs> This is what the Zimbabwean pastor wrote. I am a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. 
I am a disciple of His, and I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, mundane talking, cheap living, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right or first or tops or recognized, or praised, or rewarded. I live by faith, lean on His presence, walk by patience, lift by prayer, and labor by the Holy Spirit. I won't give up, shut up, or let up until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, and preached up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must give until I drop, Preach until all know, and work until he comes. And when he does come for his own, he'll have no problems recognizing me. My colors will be clear. <laughs> if we were to look at this passage that we have just, uh, in broad strokes, gone over, three reasons, three steps that we can take that will enable us to experience joy. Maintain Romans 8.28 thinking. Maintain that. For I am convinced that all, we know all things God works for the good of those who love Him and have called, been called according to His purpose. Number two, have a gracious attitude, especially regarding those who think a little differently than you do. <laughs> and then have God confidence. Keep your God confidence strong. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Nothing can ever happen to us without first being filtered through God's loving fingers. Keep your God confidence strong. Now, up to this point, Paul has been using his, example, his, his life as an example for the believers, uh, for how we are to live. And then he shifts focus in verse 27 to the Philippians. He, he shifts gears and he starts exhorting them on how they're to live and let's hear this exhortation for how he wants us to live. He writes, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my presence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved in that by God. For it, is not, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for Him. Since you're going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. If you have your sermon notes, you can underline three phrases. Three phrases. Verse 27, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Verse 27, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Also in verse 27, stand firm in one spirit. Stand firm in one spirit. Finally, number three, verse 29, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for Him. Uh, that's a text that doesn't get a lot of preaching on. Three short statements summarizing those three verses. Live worthy. Stand firm, suffer for Christ. Live worthy, stand firm, suffer for Christ. I'd like to end in a little bit of a different form this morning. I'm going to invite you to close your eyes and bow your heads. And I'm going to repeat those three phrases three times. I'd like you to open yourself to the ministry of the Holy Spirit as he directs how they would be applied in your life. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. Word of God. Live worthy. 
Stand firm. Suffer for Christ. Live worthy. Stand firm. Suffer for Christ. Live worthy. Stand firm. Suffer for Christ. Father, we surrender in this moment all that we are and all that we hope to be. We ask you through the power and mercy of your spirit that you would help us to flesh this out today and through this week. That we would live worthy, that we'd stand firm, and that we'd be willing joyfully to suffer for Christ. We ask this in your precious and powerful name.